Greetings, everyone. During the first troubleful stages of my marriage, I accidentally came upon a book, which made a significant impression on me, and it still does to this day. The book, which was called Fascinating Womanhood, was written by a mother of eight, Helen Andelin, who unfortunately passed away in 2009. And about the content of the book, to this day I consider it both a possibility and at the same time too good to be true. And to talk about the book and its subject and to clarify certain things, today I'm joined by Mrs. Dixie Andelin Forsyth, the eldest daughter of Helen Andelin, current president of Fascinating Womanhood, mother of seven, and her executive assistant Jennifer Cross, mother of five. And knowing about my beliefs and the direction in which I work on YouTube, they still agreed for me to remain anonymous. A fact that in itself says a lot. So please welcome. Okay, welcome uh, Dixie and Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview and to this uh, very unconditional conditions which I ask you for. Um, so, I would like to start with a small introduction on how I, I how I came on uh, fascinating womanhood. Mm -hmm. I was still married, and um, I don't know where I got this link, but uh, I guess then your husband reads fascinating womanhood. Uh, the marriage is in trouble. <laughs> mm. So I read this book, and uh, I, my jaw was on the floor, not, not you know, to say the least, because it was too good to be true. So I read it and uh, passed it to my wife, and she also read it, and uh, later a little bit tried to implement it. Uh, nothing really happened from it, but yeah, maybe later. Um, as of now, as I said, I represent, uh, well, say, um, not so much a movement, a group of people who call themselves MacTow. There are many, many blends of them, many different uh, views, and uh, sometimes uh, quite uh, quite contradictory. So uh, I may only speak for a fraction of them, but still they might be interested in what uh, what your movement and what your book is all about. And from your side, as I understand it, you represent also a minority, unfortunately, or women, uh, who might be interested in some minority of MacTows. So there is uh, a possibility not to wage war, but to build some bridges. And that's what I would like to dedicate this interview to. I hope we, uh, among negative commentaries and negative and uh, thumbs down, I hope we'll get some people interested. Maybe it will help both sides. So my first uh, question would be, um, Dixie, for, for people who have never heard about fascinating womanhood and, and don't know what book is about, uh, mm -hmm. How would you describe it in a, in a few sentences and uh, maybe it's some a, some some uh, few first-hand words about uh, the author, the original author, Helen Andelin? Uh, the original author is my mother, Helen Andelin, and she she had a decent marriage, but it wasn't the deeply romantic marriage she always dreamed of as a child, and so she was dissatisfied, and she began searching for. Uh, knowledge of how to make her marriage better and she came across some one thing here and one thing there and she and she she's a very uh, religious person she prayed a lot and she got these uh, these principles and through study and through practice and things like that and the whole purpose of fascinating women it is to help women because women are have a very key role to play in marriage help them to do their part to develop this deeply romantic marriage. Some people think that it is impossible. It's not impossible. I grew up with it. I know other people, all my sisters have it. And so when you say I represent a small minority, that's, I think that's sort of debatable because I think all women want to be, all people want to be happy. And if you have no happy families, you have no civilization. So it's that simple. And for civilization to survive, you need children, you need families. 
and to have healthy children, you need parents, not just biological offspring. So that's, that's what she started in the 60s, and it, it uh, grew, it, there was a lot of interest in it. She was on television, radio, newspapers. There was, um, she taught classes, there was opposition, but I think the feminist movement is smaller than some people think. Un unfortunately, it's very loud, and there's, um, there's a lot of women who are quiet, who don't like it. So that's why I think, uh, I think there's more that want it than maybe you might realize. Did that answer the question? So do I understand correctly? It's, uh, uh, let's say, a science, a field of science about the happy family from the female side. Yes, because you can only change yourself. It's not to tell you how to change husbands. It's how to change yourself and what you can do. Foundation. It's a foundation. Is there any kind of official courses or, or certification? Yes. A diploma yes. or something like that? You mean for a teacher or for students? For students, of course. Oh, well, both. Uh, you, well, you don't have to have an official certificate when you finish the course. Some teachers give it, but you have to. We just recently implemented a training course for teachers so that we can all be teaching exactly the same thing, and they receive certificate so that they, they can tell their students, yes, I'm certified to teach this and trained by us. Because you can teach all sorts of things. And some teachers handed out graduation certificates for this and some did not. Some were very casual in their home, just sort of like two or three women at a time. So we, we, we let it be kind of broad like that. But the teachers now need to be certified and trained. Are they available in Russia? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, we have a contract with a, a big Ru a Russian publisher there. They found us and they told us that there are so many women in Russia that are so tired of the feminist movement. They want traditional marriage. And that's why they wanted Fascinating Womanhood. It's been, I understand it's been translated. Now, uh, you said you read it in Russian, but that was old. This is a this is the updated and edited book. It's new, and it's got some of the same exact principles, but some things are kind of dated, and it was taken out. And that will be available soon. We need to contact them and see exactly when. It's because um, they said they were going to make it available to all Russian-speaking countries. And actually, they are the first. Russia is the first country in the world. To have um, to get on board with this vintage book. In the United States, it's available only through us, no problem. And we're working on Brazil. Brazil is very close, but we've had translate. We have to translate. It's always translation. So, yeah, there's a great deal of interest in Russia. Would you recommend men to read it, and why? If they want to, I mean, men men don't tend to read self help books, but if they'd like to, there's no secret. And um, I just don't know if they would be interested to read it. They might they might like it to find out what kind of woman to look for, because women who like these principles like femininity. They like being women. They the thing is, we need each other. We need men. We need men who are strong and masculine and protect us. Men are the ones who build our cities, they protect our countries, they're, they're larger, they're stronger, and we need them. And um, some women act like they don't, but that's, um, that's kind of a fantasy. We do need them. They, they, they build our roads, they work in the mines, they do things that we hate to do, that we can't do. And they've always been the ones to explore New frontiers. They're the ones that are, are the ones that build rocket ships and go into space. We and women, we're the ones who bear children. Um, men don't have babies. And without children, you have no society. You have no nations. So women in fascinating womanhood, we say women are the gatekeepers of civilization. Women tend to when they're good, and let's just assume both sides are good people. When they're good, women are the ones that that kind of gentlemen, men have a lot of testosterone, and women are the ones that can 
kind of calm them down and and um, and help them to believe in themselves. And uh, we're the gatekeepers. We're the ones who raise all the people of this planet. Because even when a man, even when when there's a single parent, women are the ones who dominate uh, daycare centers, elementary schools. Men don't tend to like that. They don't gravitate to it uh, because women are more maternal. We raise the people of this planet. And if women are corrupt, there's not a lot of hope for men. If you, I hope if I'm not talking too much. <laughs> Interrupt me if I am. But when you watch, just watch some time on the news when you see terrorists or uh, riots. Maybe you don't have them here. I mean, there, but we have them here sometimes. And you look and you see these riots. They're almost always young, unmarried men. When men have a wife or child, they tend to think, oh, that's not going to be so good for my family. And they don't tend to kind of get out of control as much when they have the stabilizing effect of a good woman. And, and men are the builders and protectors of society. So any, any group, like the feminist group, that acts like we don't need men, they're probably mostly just really hurt. They maybe haven't met. I've met women who say they have never met one good man in their life. And it sounds like, I don't know much about that organization that you represent, but it sounds like they're the men who have been really hurt and have, um, and, and, and I'm sympathetic because I've, I help my husband in his practice. He's a neuropsychologist. And uh, I've seen firsthand women that have told me they have not met one good man. And I think, but I have. The world is large. And um, my parents were good people. I, I took it for granted when I was growing up. My, my brothers are good people. My uncles were good people. Uh, there's good men in our, I know some bums too. I'm not, I'm not just totally insulated because I've seen it through my husband's practice, but don't discount the good out there because there are, there are good women. You know, in what I do, I'm so impressed with women because the women follow fascinating womanhood anyway. They're so um, humble. They tend to say, oh, I made so many mistakes. What can I do? I just really blew it. Uh, how, can I, how can I do better? Read these, they read these books and try to be better because they want. Who doesn't want to be happy? Everybody wants to be happy. I, I think I've spoken too much all at once. So, so I hope that's okay. So uh, you mentioned this new edition. Could you summarize the main differences? So what are the updates? Yes, thanks for that question. Um, the new edition, my mother, before she passed away, was talking to me about how she knew it needed to be updated. It was written in the late 50s and early 60s. And she put some things in, she put some things in there that she thought, oh, that's really dated. Like, but the timeless principles are still, they're the main ones. She, uh, she used to say that women shouldn't wear pants. Well, in those days, the pants for women weren't so great as they are now. And um, there weren't as much variety. There wasn't as much choice. And women and people dressed a little more. They dressed up probably more mm -hmm. formally. If you look at movies, when you see screenshots of people walking down the street, it looks like they're all dressed for church compared to today. And so she recognized that men like women in pants now. There's a great variety. So she, we took that out. I took out the part of, there's a part in there that says that men should handle the finances. Well, that's because she hated managing finances. I hate managing finances. But some women not only like it, but they're good at it. And that's so that's not really a timeless principle. So I removed it. Uh, the other one was the Christian scriptures. And some people have been confused by that because she, when she wrote this book, there was no internet. She didn't realize it was gonna travel to non-Christian people. And so the principles that she talks about stand for themselves, whether you back them up with Christian scripture or Muslim scripture or whatever, the, the principles are the main thing. And there, you know, there are people who are Jewish, Muslim, uh, Buddhists, uh, atheists, all these people 
And we don't want them to think that these principles don't apply to them just because they come from a different faith. This isn't a, a religious book. And people sometimes think it is. It's, we're not trying to convert anyone to a particular religion. This is about timeless principles for women, about femininity, and how to have your own lifelong love affair with the man you love. It's a worldwide movement. That's why, that's why I did it. Some people think I'm you know, not religious at all. It has nothing to do with it. That uh, sounds really surprising. Um, I'm actually quite religious myself, but, but I, I respect all religions. So, And when women ask me, you know, what about, my, does this apply to me even though I'm Jewish? And I said, of course. I, I'm mostly interested in, uh, from what you mentioned, I'm mostly interested in atheists. Atheists. We uh, you know atheists want happy marriages too. And and sometimes they they um, actually kind of change their mind later. Not always, but the principles stand for themselves. And what I say is if if because I believe in God, if God says something, if you figure out why He said it, it's true. Whether you someone says God says it or whether Plato says it, it's, if it's a true principle, it's true. And you can say okay leave God out of it, it's still true. He actually did say it, but if, you, if that doesn't comfortable for you, that's okay, because it's true. Truth stands by itself. I want to bring an analogy. I, I, I doubt that you have seen it, but there is a, a Soviet fairy tale called The Old Genie Hotabich, which basically tells about... Uh, uh, is, there, is there a genie in it, you say? Genie. Yes. You surprised? I have heard of that because I have a Russian daughter-in-law, and she gave me a fairy tale book because I'm interested in art that has. I saw a genie, and she was telling me this story about the genie. I've seen the beautiful uh, paintings. Yeah, so so they go through certain happenings during during the story, and there is one point where uh, uh, the boys needed needed to make a phone call. And of course, at the time, it was only possible through a phone booth. And there was, there was a queue, a long queue. So this genie you know, takes uh, a couple of uh, hairs from his uh, bed and makes uh, another phone booth. And it is not working. And as they check out, the, the, it's made of very fine marble and gold and something else, but it's not working because it's not, it's not a phone booth. It's just uh, a thing. I'm a bit, a bit strange to hear that uh, you can take the scriptures altogether out. I understand that you could b probably make a, a version for for Muslims, for example, for Jewish, but to take it completely sounds. Um, okay, let me put it this way: How about if you say it's really bad for society if we kill each other? That's a true statement, isn't it? It's not good to kill your neighbors. You can say that or you can quote it from a scripture. Both are true. It's like you're putting it in, but you're putting it in more scientific terms because you're not trying to convert someone to a religion. You can, you can have a book that has religious principles in it but doesn't quote scripture. The point is, is if, like, say, let's, let's say you are um, Muslim and I'm Christian. If I say a principle... If I quote a scripture from the Bible, and you don't believe in the Bible, that scripture won't have much meaning to you. If I say the principle, even though if I say it in another word, in other words, it's the same thing. Like it's not good to kill your neighbor. You might think, yeah, it is good. Well, it's whether it's in the Bible or whether you say it independently from quoting it, it's still true, and people recognize truth. But if they, if they belong to a different religion, sometimes it kind of bars them from, like, well, I don't, I don't believe in that, the Bible, so therefore I can't accept this truth. That's, that's all we're doing. And I've known people who have written, very religious people who've written books on philosophy, and I think, hey, this is, this is stuff in the scriptures. But they just said it in a secular way so people can accept it more. It's the same thing. You're just not using it as an authority. It's no, no point to use it as an authority for people who cannot connect with it.
Uh, actually, I, I would uh, I would emphasize I'm not so much about the scriptures themselves, but uh, about this uh, the super being. Let's see. Not long ago, I made a video about uh, just one criteria, which I posed as a, as a critical for for a, a real marriage, and it was that uh, the wife should put her husband first, and the husband should put uh, should put his wife first. Right. Uh, and, and this uh, point alone raised so many, uh, and, and, and some when other people uh, raise it, it raises so so many objections, and maybe 80 or maybe 90 percent of people uh, cut off uh, instantly. Why does so, why does that bother them? Do you know? What do they don't What don't they like? For different reasons, uh, some some just say that children are, uh, should be first. Here's the problem with that. You know, you have to define what do you mean by first because when you're okay let's say you're dating somebody and you're in love and you're about to get engaged you get married that's about all you think about is that other person you don't have to say now remember don't forget to make your fiance number one of course they are and when children come along sometimes you have to you have to put a lot of time children are hard to raise they take a lot of time, they take a lot of effort, but in your heart, your spouse can still be number one. We're not talking about physical time. We're talking about your heart because you know when you marry, let's say you marry somebody named Anne, and you and Anne get married, what, what, you may never have children. You may have children. Whether you do or don't, when you're 75 years old, it's going to be you and Anne still. It's not those children are going to be grown and gone. And sometimes they live in different countries. I have a daughter that lives in Korea. Sometimes they, they move away. And they, if, you, if you don't have that relationship with your spouse, solid, if you say, I'm taking, my, I'm taking my affections, my main affections and thoughts away from you onto them, they're going, they don't care as much as you do. They will grow up and have their own families. And you'll be just mom and dad. You won't have anything that when and your children want you to be have a good marriage it's not great for your kids for you to break up in a way if you put each other number one you are putting your children there too because if you have a good marriage you're not going to have a come from have your children come from a broken family so it, you know you're a good example my mother used to say the greatest gift you can give your children is a good marriage with their husband their father I, th I remember as a kid, a child, I thought, yeah, I, that that was seemed true to me. The great one of the greatest gifts you can give your children is a good marriage, instead of having them come from broken or unhappy home. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. That uh, statistically speaking, uh, by seventy-five, most likely they would be divorced, and probably the man would be dead, at least in Russia. So. Oh dear, uh, yeah, well. Maybe I shouldn't have said 75, but maybe 60 or whatever. Children, children grow up and they leave and they have their own lives. But, and then you're left with somebody or nobody. or With grandchildren, yeah. That's the next step. Not even live near you. you, don't, you in the end, what you really have is you and that other person that you married. And so putting emphasis on your marriage is always a good idea. It doesn't mean that you are bad parents. It doesn't mean that when your child is sick, forget it, you don't get up in the night. Of course you do. My husband knows that he is always number one for me. And I had seven children. I still, they're all still living. So I still, they're just grown ups. Do any of them live in my house? No. Sometimes they kind of forget about me for periods of time. Not really, but you know. They're busy with their own lives, their own families. If I did not have a good relationship with my husband, I would have nothing because I don't have it daily. My, I have no grandchildren running around here. It's just me and Bob. That's why there is a, a, an empty nest crisis. That's how it's... Well, that, yeah, but when, when, you've got, when you've got a woman who's practicing fasting womanhood and a good man, You've got a second honeymoon. That's what's great. You think our, our kids are grown. We can have all those dates. We can we can watch a movie at night together. We can travel and all these things. That's 
that's what's so great is your kids are grown and now it's just us again. I had my first baby when I was 20 years old, barely 20. And I, we didn't get a lot of time, just the two of us alone. Uh, and then, you know, I had seven, so I was very busy. But uh, we do now, and we like it. <laughs> it's fun. Isn't that what everybody wants? We love seeing our kids. We had some over last night, but they're not here right now. I guess um, I could I could say that um, maybe maybe the main reason is that nobody uh, teaches that there is something something else something more to it. That is why fascinating womanhood is so important because this this feminist thing that started in uh, whenever it originally started in like 1920 when women got the right to vote which. They needed the right to vote. I think it was kind of ridiculous that they didn't have it. But they went too far. They went way too far. They, they, um, they started acting like men were the enemy. But you got to remember, all women are not feminists. The reason you think that so many of them are is because they scream the loudest. The ones of us who don't like that are busy. We're busy raising families, building our marriages, and wonder, or there's a bunch of others that wonder what to do. They're looking. Some, one woman told me there are so many of us at night, every night, searching on the internet for anything that will help us with our marriage. They don't want it to end. They don't want it to be bad. Women are less satisfied with a sort of average marriage than men. Women are quicker to think, this isn't as romantic as I want it. And uh, if they think that going out and having a career and a job is going to help. It will, it's empty. It makes you money, but money is not everything. It's only one thing. It doesn't make up for, there is nothing as wonderful in this world as deeply loving someone who adores you in return. There is nothing better. Money, nothing better. May I jump back a little bit in this context? Uh, if we, if we're talking about Christians, Christians uh, can very plainly say that there is this uh, so-called a super task to the marriage, yeah, and it's uh, saving our soul. And if you take the scriptures out, is there a super task in the marriage? I still mention God. I take the scriptures out, but I still leave God in because God is in every religion, and. Uh, and in every relationship, you have to have a spiritual component. It, it, it isn't, it, we haven't made it atheistic at all. Not even, no, uh, you know, not, not in the new book, I talk about it too. And we didn't mention that, but I've written a new book that is just about to come out. It's just in final editing. And uh, it has even more information in it than my mother's. There's more out there. And so I put it in and it talks about, it talks about, um, feminine power, which is completely different than masculine power. And, and how important uh, having a foundation of spirituality. Spirituality isn't necessarily religious, but in my world it is, but it doesn't have to be religious, but you must have a sense of something higher than yourself in your life it, it, to guide you. So, and maybe we've misunderstood one, one, one another because taking, I have not taken God out. So, does that answer? Yes, but uh, I will press a little bit. Again, in the no scripture version. So, uh, are we talking that uh, I understand there is no, there's nothing called sin in this sense? Yeah? Well, you can substitute sin for. Uh, things that don't work, things that work against you, and that's really what sin is talking about. It's just it's a word that's used. That w what I understand sin is is anything you do that is not like what God would do, and that would be whether you use the word sin or you use dysfunctional or doesn't work or, and you can use different words for the same thing, but we're this isn't meant to be a religious book. If that makes sense. When I found out after I took over Fascinating Womanhood that when my mother had it translated into Japanese, they told her 
this isn't going to be accepted because people are not Christian here. They're more Buddhist. So can I take out scripture verses and put something else? My mother let them do that. I don't know what exactly they did because I can't read Japanese. So um, maybe, I don't know. I don't know whether it worked or not, but they did sell a lot of books and they kept the principles there. Principles of, okay, when I'm talking about principles, I mean understanding men, accepting men at face value, accepting people at face value, not trying to change them. You can change yourself. These are all principles that fit with Christianity. Um, admiration, men's need for admiration and appreciation and sympathetic understanding. All those things are, I mean, I, you've read it, sympathetic understanding. Uh, femininity, we are completely different genders. Uh, accentuating the differences between men and women. All these things are principles that are true principles that when you apply them, sometimes they have miraculous results. So in this new sense and the new edition, what is uh, your and the movement's position on a premarital sex or sex out of uh, marriage or cohabitation or sex whatsoever? Okay, I'm so glad you asked these things. You asked the great questions. Um, premarital sex undermines relationships. I know, I know and uh, Christians believe God says you shouldn't do that. Well, there's a reason he said you shouldn't do it. He just left it to us to figure it out. Well, there's good solid principles behind it. it, it, it there's a lot of pain. It undermines, and I talk about it a lot in the new book, and there's a, le uh, a chapter called Levels of Relationship Development. And it means that when you meet somebody, even if you're standing in the store and you meet somebody in line, you get to know someone. First, you get to know them intellectually. How are you? Uh, where are you from? You might talk about the weather, things like that. If you get along well, you move to another level, which is emotional. And that's where you talk about how you feel about something. You might even talk a little bit about politics or. Um, you know, some pain in your life or some joy in your life, things like that. And if you still get, if, this is how healthy relationships develop. And if you still get along and you, you might see each other, start seeing each other, and then you develop to the next phase, which is spiritual. And that is whether you include religion, organized religion or not, that's your, how you connect to things, how you feel about the meaning of life life after death, things that are the closest to your heart, uh, those kind of things. And then the last level, believe it or not, is physical. And that doesn't mean holding hands or hugging. But when you jump into sexual intimacy, before you've developed all these other levels in, it, as a foundation to your relationship, it can undermine the whole thing. And that's what usually happens in a living together, that sort of thing. They, they skip that in favor of just making the physical relationship almost the, it's the lowest common denominator and the thing is when women experience sex they release a, a chemical called uh, oxytocin and men men have it too but women have more of it oxytocin is a very bonding chemical and it makes women feel bonded to a person if you're bonded to somebody that you haven't developed these are this other relationship with and why would by the way why would someone say no let's not get married they don't want responsibility what's the reason and there's you know just so well we don't want just in case we break up it's it's uh, the sexual component often gets people in trouble quicker than anything so yeah if if when women and women don't like it as much as men whether you believe it or not because when a woman uh, is, I have women write to me all the time and they say, I'm living with my boyfriend. We have two children. I really want to be married. It makes her feel vulnerable to have children. His safety is very important to women. And he doesn't care about marriage because he really has everything he wants now without any commitment. And, it, and women like the family thing, the bonding thing. It's very important to them. And when women get chemically bonded, physically bonded to a man, it's harder for them to use their head to say, you know, this isn't a good match for me. So, so yeah, that, it, premarital sex is what we call it in fasting womanhood. It's high risk. You might get away with it, 
but the risk is high. I've got statistics on it in my new book, which my mother didn't do because she didn't know about it. She had no internet like I do. Well, I, I'm sure later we will discuss the, the why, why men don't want to, to get married. That's a, a lot of causes yeah. for this. That. Yes, and I understand. That's not, yeah, it's a big responsibility, and I'm sympathetic. But I will say that men will love marriage when it's good. When it's good. That's for sure, but statistics is not on our side. Not anymore, but you know, the principles are still true and there's still plenty of people that want it. Everybody wants it. Some people just don't believe in it anymore. Actually, I can get my mind over the fact that for a fascinating woman, or a woman practicing fascinating womanhood, that actually what you said could be, it makes sense. But for the yeah. general population, it's, it's, it sounds very doubtful to me. Well, my mother's book has shown over 50 years that it works, and there's many, many women that like it, that want it. Uh, let's say a man looks for a woman, a fascinating woman, yeah, in the sense of the book and the woman, the movement. What are his re uh, reasonable chances? So what percentage of women uh, could qualify as fascinating? I don't know that there's, my mother sold 5 million copies. Um, and she didn't have internet. Okay. So we, we were talking uh, about the chances of meeting a, a fascinating woman. Oh, the, the math, math, you're into math. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not great at math myself, but I think it's less now than it will be. We are movement, we wanna change this world. We're sick of the feminist thing. It doesn't work, mm -hmm. it hurts us, it hurts men, it hurts families, it doesn't work. So statistics, I don't really know. But, um, but uh, Fascinating Womanhood Vintage is about to be uh, on the market in Russia. And what other countries speak Russian? I see, I don't really know Ukraine. Most, most of the USSR, well, Ukraine is a special case at the moment. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, they, they understand. I don't, I'm not sure that they will read it, but they understand. Oh, we have a teacher in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. And uh, she speaks Russian. I think she, she, her writing looks like it's Russian when I see it on the internet. Yes. Could be. Okay, if you're not talking about chances, then maybe uh, something to look for. Uh, what, what, what signs, how to check, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, they need to be, there's a lot of lost people. But there's, there's women who want this, but they have no idea. And we're at a disadvantage now because a lot of women are raised by angry feminist mothers or fathers or no, no uh, parents or things like that. So, but you can't just throw people out because they don't know. Like uh, Jenny, are you on? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Jenny, Jenny's an example. She didn't grow up with this, but she found it and she recognized the truth in it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it helped her to know where to go. You can best say for yourself. Yeah, it, it certainly did. It helped. It saved my second marriage. And uh, Sergey and I were just talking about fail rate of marriages. And I, I think, I know for me, it saved my second marriage. And also, uh, I said, the stats say, if we're going to talk stats, 80% of second marriages fail and 50% of first marriages. But Sergey has a different... Uh, Stat. But there's, a, there's another statistic too that I have in my new book, and that is the statistics on you staying together. Because we were talking before about mm -hmm. living together versus getting married. Oh yeah. The statistics are way against you staying together if you just live together versus marriage. It is so, it is so um, lopsided that if, if people knew those statistics, they get married. Because it's so, it's, it's so high risk to do it. Why would you want to do something high risk that is so important in your life? Like, for example, my husband had a patient once <clears throat> who told him that the main street in the town we live in, he, he would go get drunk and drive 100 miles an hour down the main street 
holding on to the steering wheel with one finger. Most people would say that's pretty high risk behavior, but he, he congratulated himself because he didn't die. Well, we think, yeah, but the chances of you dying are so high. But his attitude is, I didn't, therefore I was safe. We, he felt so powerful, but feeling powerful does not make you powerful. So doing something high risk just because you get away with it for even a period of time doesn't mean it's not high risk. So statistics are solidly against a living together. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But, but the, this other question of statistics of your marriage relationships, it's, it's because people don't either they're, uh, if they're personally corrupt, that's another whole thing. But I think most people are basically want to be good people. And they don't want to go out and be serial killers, things like that, and terrorists. But they, they don't have any idea how to do it and how to have yeah. this kind of relationship. And that's where men, men play a part, but women are the gatekeepers. Because whether you understand or not, women read more self-help books. They just do. And I think it's because uh, my husband says, uh, you, should, you should say hello, Bob. Sergey, have you met my husband? Not yet. Oh, now you will. Okay. I got a stool. But he's taller than me, so. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bob. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Says he. Fine. He was working on some report while we were talking. He, he's, a, he's a neuropsychologist. He has some patients. So. I'm a brain guy, all about the brain. Yeah. Let's see. By, by the way, if, if you are the brain guy, you might have heard about the. Uh, I think uh, she's a, a clinic psychiatrist. Uh, Helen Smith, and her book is called Men on Strike. Oh, yeah. She talks about the risks uh, risks in marriage for, for men. And, and the risks, uh, she summarizes, are so high at the moment, uh, we're talking about Western countries mostly, that uh, they outweigh uh, most of the possible uh, pros. That's, that's the point of the book, like generally. Well, the thing is, she focuses... Uh, she focuses on economic and um, sort of financial risks. She doesn't really talk about legal risks. And legal risks. She doesn't talk about the principles that make a marriage work. And, you know, sure, there's a lot of risks, but there's a lot of risk of me getting up in the morning and going to work. There's risk of going into a certain profession. Uh, you know, th there's there's a lot of problems and and. Uh, legal problems in my profession. People sue people. Sure, there's risks all over the place, but the principles that help you develop and establish a great marriage and a relationship, uh, you know, I mean, we got to learn them. Well, I That's saw all. a little video clip of her, and I thought she comes from the point of view that your marriage will end. What if it's what if it's amazing? Then these these risks she talks about evaporate out the window. Uh, economic risks, are you kidding? Legal risks. Legal yeah. risks, th those mean nothing. She's like she's preparing to have a bad problem. And, you know, Dixie and I have been married for 47 years. And I've all often felt like I was the luckiest man in the world because I married a fascinating woman mm -hmm. when I was very young. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> yeah. I feel it's kind of unfair maybe, but I've been together with Dixie for 47 years. And uh, we are closer, and I love her more now than I did then, mainly because I was immature and kind of stupid. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I didn't know that much. I didn't really know what I was doing. But, um, you know, we have, we have built something together. And I'll tell you, anybody would, ha if they knew what we have, they'd say, I want to sign up for that. I'll, I'll do that. But I see so much pain, and I see so many people struggling and suffering and i think a lot of it's because they just really don't know what to do how to do this there are there are things that make you successful in a marriage just like there's things that make you successful in business or anything else you do and if you follow those things that make you successful you're going to have a good experience if you do things that don't work um then there's so many of them you're you're going to say oh that's terrible so we say, okay, so marriage and 
relationships are terrible, there's too many risks, let's forget it. Look, that's civilization depends on strong, healthy marriages and families. That's yes. the future of our of our world. Let's say you don't, we're going to get along without women. Uh, that's really counterproductive to civilization. It doesn't mm -hmm. work, and it'll just or vice versa. I might say, as as a as a, after all, I'm a bit of a macto. Uh, right. He'll say the I'll say the, to help the civilization for uh, because at this price it makes no sense. So yeah, okay. let, let. I'm sympathetic to that, but I think just like some of the people that I've known, everybody lives in kind of their own world. There's the people they know, their relatives, their friends, their associates, and they don't always know the bigger picture of what's out there in the world that I live in, and I mean my family, my picture. And, and, and this fascinating womanhood, there are millions. Mm -hmm. There are millions of people who want this. This isn't small. They're, no. they're, they're more quiet, maybe, because, you know, there's a quote. Who said it? I can't remember it said. I think it's in my new book. It said, uh, the reason good men are hard to find is because they're usually working. And it's the same yeah, as true. with women. The reason good women are hard to find is because they're usually busy. And not doing, I mean, these, these feminists, they are loud. They're, they're not out clubbing. And they make it seem like they're the majority. I saw a little video clip of a cartoon that you sent me, Jenny, of yeah. a man and woman. That, the kind of woman that was portrayed, I've known women like that. Me too. They're not my acquaintances. No. They're not my friends. No. no. I mean, there's no. plenty of women who who recognize that they love men, they need men, and men need us. And it's, it's ridiculous to uh, allow yourself to be so bitter that you fail to see uh, a beautiful sunset off in the distance because you've gone through a storm. There's, I understand and I'm sympathetic to the worlds that some people live in, that they have, that that's all they know, but there is more. And there's, there's fantastic women. There's some bombs, bombettes. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And that's, I just have to say, for me, both, Bob, Bob, you said it, you know, we weren't taught this. My generation, I was a child in the 70s. I was not taught femininity. I was taught the lie of feminism. And it really, it, all it brought me was terrible first marriage and disappointment and complete confusion. And so when I got fascinating womanhood in my hands in the nineties, it was the first time I realized and other FW women will tell you, Oh my gosh, I can make him happy this way by just being who I really wanted to be in my core anyway, which was a feminine woman. And, um, and it, and it's about inspiring masculinity and, and making your husband happy and not only just your husband, your family and other people around you. It's a, it's a character building. Yeah. These, these men that are involved in this, how do you pronounce it? Mom? MGTOW. MGTOW. We need you to be masculine men, not to give up on women. Women need men to protect us and to build civilization. We need you. We need masculinity. But we, we, we understand that. No. I think oh, in, in my knowledge of MGTOW, that they don't like that, that they have the pressure of that. Is it really an honor or a burden? That's, that's a yeah. tough question. Yes, it is. I would say both. Well, we need masculine men. And I, by masculine, I don't mean uh, abusive. Abusive men. That's not no, masculine. That's not masculine. That's just bad behavior. That's criminal that's behavior. That's just bad behavior. But we need the, the new book. My new book has three main sections. One of them is reclaiming femininity. Women have lost a lot of it because the feminist movement yeah. has tried to abolish that. Reclaiming femininity and understanding it. Number two, middle section is inspiring masculinity in the men around us, including our brothers, our fathers, inspiring them through just believing in it, for one thing. And then the third section is taking this knowledge and helping to build a lifelong love affair with the man you love. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, then going back again, uh, Helen Smith was talking about statistics and chances. So again, okay. are there any advices on the, if a man wants to, to meet uh, not, not 20, 20 years after, after a bad marriage, yeah? if he wants it to, uh, from a start, what, what are the, the signs to look for or maybe places or oh. whatever? 
Any advice? <laughs> Red flags. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just like it's just like in fascinating womanhood and and I know I keep saying my new book because there's so much more in it there's a chapter that talks about red flags for women to look for there's red flags for men yeah. it's probably not a great idea to meet women in bars and clubs because when you're drinking Jenny you were talking about that once people look a lot better when <laughs> their beer goggles on yeah, <laughs> yeah. you meet mm -hmm. meet people in places like in uh, places like universities, uh, church, uh, work workplaces, community, community organizations, and community volunteer work workplaces, mm -hmm. on in fascinating womanhood. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe uh, on this big group we have on Facebook, I don't tend to approve men joining, but I thought maybe I should because they can see women. There's single women that that are on there, and um, why not? Because there's women, there's the women who get on that group want to know about this. It's not a dating site at all. It's a, it's more of an educational site and a, a support site. But you could certainly see what kind of women are out there. And we're there we're women from all over the world. Unfortunately, English is the language we use, and so I, we're not getting many Asians. And I think it's a language barrier. And Japan also, Japan has had that. You, they've they sold a ton of books. Well, we've in got Japan. three. Oh teachers. yeah, very yeah. popular there. We've got three teachers there, but it's really hard to communicate with them because I don't speak Japanese, and I I need someone there. South America is another one. Spanish. We've just fascinating womanhood. We've just had it uh, translated into Spanish again. It's been it's been not available for decades, but there's millions and millions of people who speak Spanish. So I'm, I'm hoping to find somebody who can be a representative for all the Spanish speaking. I've got a Portuguese one, but not Spanish and Russian. I don't, I've got my daughter-in-law, but there's this um, Exmo, a publisher in Russia that is, is publishing in Russia. And I wish we could find a head of Russia for fascinating. Women. I'm, I'm hoping one appears who speaks good English so we can communicate, can help, can help. yeah, yeah. I think with Russian women, you won't have any problems with English because there's a thing which uh, everyone in the Red Pill movement or Mecto knows, it's called hypergamy. So Russian women look uh, as a good opportunity to, to migrate to, uh, to a better economic state. Yeah, that's in, in any country and also, it's, it's not a secret, yeah? It's, uh, I, I'm not the author of the term Mail ordered bride, yeah. So, yeah. if if yeah. you have a section on the forum, it definitely will be used for as, as a as a device for. You know, <laughs> there's a there's a woman. I don't know where she's from. I, I think she's from the United States. She's a she's a black girl, and she said in her her culture where she grew up, um, she was taught that when you get married, you run the home. Women run the home. You and your husband is just there to bring home a paycheck. Mm. She said she, she, she read this book and thought this is com I've learned completely backwards what I need to do. And she said it has totally changed her marriage because her parents taught her she need, her husband is just there for the paycheck, and both of them are very unhappy. And so she's that was in that little subculture in this country. And there's lots of subcultures in your country, in this country, in all countries. And I hate to say it, but feminism has played a huge part of diverting women off the real path to their own happiness. Yes, so true. By the way, since we already spoken of, of uh, hypergamy, there, there was a, a chapter, or a, at least a point, in, in the old version at least, specifically stating that the men should be given opportunity to, to to make a living. Yeah. So basically, he should uh, earn more, which is exactly what hypergamy is. So in uh, in the sense that uh, uh, at the moment there are more women graduating from colleges and they have higher salary. And uh, by the way, Warren Farrell in his uh, books says that even 50 years ago it was already known that never married women. Uh, earned more than never married men for 50 years ago. So it's already was. Uh, the more education women get, the higher the positions they uh, get. So how, how it's going to work in fascinating womanhood? Well, who who is raising children? 
it, at this moment, it's hard to say really. It's 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 very. Uh, you know well, who's raising? You know who's raising many children, daycare centers, and schools who do not love your child. I don't want my I don't want my children raised by people who do not love them. And a lot of women, I'm communicating with this wonderful woman in Germany. She's so frustrated because she said in her country, if you want to stay home and raise your children, you're looked down on by society, like you're not doing your part. It is hard to raise children. I, my sister, I haven't think I've told you this before, she has 15. She wanted a huge family. Her dream was always to have a huge family and live on a farm. And they all do homeschool. And she looks like one of her kids. She looks young. She does. She does. She's really great. And her kids are all responsible. She's got doctors and all her kids are grown up. She still has some at home. But you can't, she, you cannot raise children really well because it's hard. And, and have a big career over here and do this over here. Either if the woman tries to do it, it's exhausting when they're small. And so what women have given themselves a task of, you have to do everything. You have to go to school, education. So that means you probably aren't going to have children while you're in college. Mm -hmm. Then if you decide to have them, you're not going to have very many because it's too hard. And raising them, you're going to basically rely on early child care people who you don't really know what they do when you're gone to work. When yeah. you take your six-week-old baby and put them in child care, you... You don't really know what they're doing. The children can't even talk. And they spend all day in this other environment. You get them on evenings and weekends. And for women, to, who raises the people of this planet? People who don't love them or families. And sometimes women must work. They find themselves in this situation. A lot of women do. Sometimes they're single. Sometimes their husband is injured or sick or isn't doesn't really have enough of an education to bring in hardly anything. There's all kinds of stuff. We can do what we have to do, but it's not, it is not ideal. It's not the best. Mm -hmm. So just because you can earn money, people act like this, this woman I'm talking to in Germany, her country acts like the most valuable thing anyone can do is make money. Seriously. Make money. And then you die. When, when you are successful, wife your successful mother mm -hmm. you may not go down in the history books but you'll go down in your family's history mm -hmm. your children and what you do can can have effect generations just like jenny and i sometimes talk about princess diana mm -hmm. she died over 20 years ago but her influence on her sons are going through they're going to go through generations because of what the time that she spent with them mm -hmm. teaching them to not be such um, pampered and titled, pampered and titled people who, who don't connect with ordinary people. Mm -hmm. She changed that. And it lasts after she dies. So you can say money is number one. Well, I say it sometimes is with some people they get desperate. And you have to do what you have to do. But to, to plan your life around that being number one and being the most important is really sad. Because it isn't, and it's it, hollow. I think it's priorities uh, that are that are mixed up. Personally, I mean, a job doesn't really make a person happy. Money doesn't really make you happy. Mm -hmm. I know for me, I've had uh, great success in my my profession. I've made a lot of money, but what really makes me happy is my marriage, my kids, my grandkids and the time that we have together. And those relationships I can't buy. You know, if I was the president of some huge corporation and made billions of dollars, but I had no family, you know, oh. it's, it's a misplaced priority because I think relationships, good relationships in your marriage and your family are what make you really happy. I don't think that money or jobs or uh, uh, being being the head of some big company, oh big, you know, big deal. I'm not impressed when somebody tells me, "Well, I'm the head of this corporation." I say, "Okay, well, what's your family like? Are you married?" Oh no, I didn't have time for that, or that's not important. Yeah, well, 
I don't know. I, I don't know. Lonely existence. Yes, so that's existence. Where do, I, where do people go after they work? They go home. Remember that quote, Dixie? Right. Oh. By, uh, C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. And I wish I still had it on my fridge. I should. Well, well we you, did you, know, you go out and you build the world, right? You're, you, and then you, you want to come home to the comforts of home. And who creates that comfort and the atmosphere? Mostly women. Mostly women. Not and all. Women are, yeah, it's hard when women are out doing the same thing all day. Right. They come home. Um, I know a woman whose husband was so unhappy. He was really grouchy. And she finally, when they went out to dinner, she finally said, what is going on? And he admitted that when they both came home from work around the same time, there was no food cooking. It was just a, kind of a dark, empty house. They both came home from work. From and work. Hungry, oh, exhausted. Tired. And, and, and when she realized he missed coming home to smelling something cooking. So she, we got together with her and she developed some uh, slow cooker crock pot meals so that she could put it in in the morning and both of them would have it. But that's one of the things women give up when they have these careers. And again, I keep saying they, they sometimes have to. I'm yeah. not sympathetic. We live in a strange world where feminism has put us in these weird situations. But it's not, it doesn't, doesn't make for the best family. And the, the strongest union is a power couple of a great, of a, a good man and a good woman who combine the masculinity and their femininity. That's, you have the greatest chance of success when you have, uh, when a man has a strong, supportive woman behind him. Mm -hmm. That's a true power couple. That's a true power couple. I have to say that uh, most men never had an option to to stay at home and look for children, and it's really, I can now uh, looking backward, I can I can value it now, but I never had this option, and some people are now right. want this, and uh, I mean men mostly, and some men are, are prepared to go such a long way to do it that they can go to another country, have a surrogate mother, a surrogate baby, and get back to their own country just so that nobody would be able to take it from them because they are at risk. The, yeah, and the problem too is when you have that baby, you're not providing them with parents. You're providing them with just one. So they're required to grow up with one parent only. And it's better than nothing, but it's not, it's not ideal. If you have a, a girl and she has no mother or a boy and she ha he has no mother, or vice versa. Like some of these Hollywood stars are having a baby just because they want a baby for them, not realizing that that child, they're depriving them of having parents, just one. And if there's no option, then you just do it. But if you choose to do that and say, I'm gonna have this child and they're gonna be mine, you don't picture them as a teenager wishing they had a mother or wishing if it's a, if it's a woman, wishing they, wish they, they had, had a, a father, father. Yeah. and they don't have a father in their life. So it's not a great idea either. It's maybe just sort of putting something together that's better than nothing, maybe, but. Actually, as Carolinda said, the, my, my, my previous guest, he said that um, many studies uh, show that uh, single fathers are much better at doing their job as parents as single, than single mothers. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2015 or 2016 was the first year in the United States, where more children uh, were born uh, uh, outside of marriage than inside of a marriage. Yeah, and it, it doesn't make for stable. Half of everyone. Yeah. It yeah. Well, just because people do it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way to do it. You know. And and also, uh, men can parent, but they parent like men, and women parent like women. They're not mothers; they're fathers, and they can be nurturing, but they'll do it in a man way and not a woman's way. They're different. Well, if a child, I think a child uh, develops the most balance when they have both the skills and the perspective that a man can bring to parenting and the skills and perspective that a mother can bring to parenting. Mm -hmm. That combination has the pet best chance, chance for 
you know, a, a real balanced individual. Sure, I, I, I see men who do great at parenting in many ways. I see women who do great at parenting and, and they're on their own. But the, the principle is, uh, to me, is let's, let's uh, if possible, let's promote great marriages and have parents because I personally believe that that's the way God set it up, that there's men and women for a reason and they have to come together to have children. Uh, I, need, I need Dixie, and I think Dixie needs me, and together we can do something way better than either of us alone. Together we're way more than one of us uh, just on our own. Like I said, no doubt about this, uh, I agree. The, the yeah. question is about chances again chances as, as to promoting aim into that no. yes uh, statistics you know I, there's a lot of statistics people say well marriages half of them don't work so why get married uh, you know I don't know to me that's that's sad because there's there's ways to for things to work and there's things that we can learn that make things work and to just say well uh, statistics say it doesn't work so don't even try. Uh, uh, to me, that's too bad because I think people miss out on a, a great deal of richness in life if they say, well, let's not, let's take, not, tr let's not <laughs> take the risk. Let's not take the chance. It's too risky. And to me, it's like somebody, I've had people, I remember when I was younger, uh, I wanted to go to school and get an education and get my doctor's degree. I had people even in my family say, Oh, it's not worth it. It's too much too work. Expensive. Costs too much money. No guarantee. Uh, there's no guarantee right. you'll be successful. You know, I had so many negatives. I was surprised, actually, even coming from some of my own family members. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, but you know, this is something that is important to me. I'm going to see if I can do it. I'm going to take the risk. And you know, I remember it, it one. turned. It turned. It's turned out incredibly good for me. But. Well, I remember one family member told them, there's doctors pumping gas. They can't get jobs. And then <laughs> my mother said, I, I think you remember it. She said, there's always room at the top of anything. And I know oh, you. Oh, I know. love that. There's always room at the well, top. Well, her mother encouraged me. She said, she no, go for it. You go for it. She yeah. believed in, in me and she encouraged me. And uh, even back then, she was inspiring my masculinity mm -hmm. as just as she was inspiring Dixie's femininity mm -hmm. and uh, you know I've often thought you know I, th I think Dixie is actually smarter than I am oh, I and she could have done all kinds of things educationally but I am so grateful that she was willing to commit to me together and have children and build a family and a life now we're we're getting a little older but we've got we've got a family and I know I know people at Christmas. I know guys at Christmas. They've got, they had nobody. Right. And they may be, and one of them's a doctor. And he said, well, you know, I've got money. I've got my degree uh, and I'm, I'm, you got a dog. yeah, he says he had a dog and he says he's, he's, he's really uh, popular at work, but he doesn't have any family. And he kind of, you know, he said in a way he kind of envied what we have. And so, uh, you know, statistics. Okay, wh whatever. Well, men, men, are, men have always been, men have always been brave. Take chances, take risks. But I think too, you know, fascinating womanhood speaks to people who want to be in marriage, who believe in the institution of marriage, and want to have great marriages. If MGTOW believers don't want to have marriage, then. Right. Go then they don't have to have it. I mean, you know, no, fascinating yeah. womanhood isn't saying everybody's got to get married. It's just speaking to all women and men have a marriage. Women, you guys own the key to your happiness and can inspire this great marriage. And, you know, who I don't know if the messages are the same because a MGTOW hearing this from what I've learned probably thinks that Dixie and I are probably lying and being manipulative and and also and not sincere. That's the message I got from what MGTOWs think about women. Mm -hmm. And it just that MGTOW men just don't want to be married and that's okay. I, I mean if they no, there's that. a problem with that. If they don't want to be married, are they saying they're going to be celibate? 
answer me that. Yeah, different know. different kinds of them, the different levels. Different there's yeah, I guess there's different levels. In extreme yes. levels there's no 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 interaction with women at all. With women all the same. Extreme. They've been so hurt. I, I yeah, feel bad. bad to me too. Yeah, because people who do that have really been wounded, and I I feel bad that they've had to go They're through. Angry. Even their mother, like, oh, probably lots. I know some of Bob's patients. Yeah, parents. Uh, it's sometimes they've just seen how their father was treated or another relative. Yes. Right. You know, and how about uh, the stat that men who are married live longer? I mean, that's just that's been hard. disproved many times. I, I, Throwing out random stats, <clears throat> random stat I've heard my whole life that men who are married live longer. Th that is true, but it's the same st the same error as with uh, marriage. Like fifty percent fail, fifty percent cannot fail, because the marriages are more or less stable in <clears throat> within society. So, mm -hmm. for them to be stable, uh, it needs to be like ninety five percent have to fail, one way or another. What we need is to re-educate people what it takes to have this great marriage because that's what people need it's what what they deeply want but there's some people have just given up and it's sad because it's there it's actually well, the children are the ones who suffer and that's the problem that's happening yeah. because people women are bringing children into one parent or marriages or one parent families and then men, that's what Sergey's saying, is men want to bring in a child to a one-parent marriage, and that would be almost better. It's better for the man. It, and, and for the child, too, that's, uh, if, well, you, if you believe the science. How is that better for the child to be raised in daycare? Why, why day, daycare? We're not talking about daycare. We're talking about single mother versus single father. So single father, though, once, you know, goes to the wherever, and has a surrogate baby, right? Brings this baby back to where he lives. He's got to go work. Who, who watches the baby? When well, who provides? That, that's that's the different. Different men organize it differently. If if you okay. have if you have enough money, that's the best way there is. Because okay. you take the time off your work for three, five years, if you can, if you can get longer, do it. That's the best way. But it's. Is People who have it have the, the money, yeah? It's really one, of the pro one of the problems with statistics is it depends on where they get them from. Why, exactly. do, sti why do statistics not all match up with each other? That, because that's, right. that's why I was That's always the problem random. with feminists. They have right. different statistics. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, I, I'm still, I still, I sound like I really hate feminists. I think they're mostly like the MGTOWs. They're mostly really wounded. Yeah. And so we shouldn't feel no compassion for them because I think they, if we could look at their lives, we'd think, oh, no wonder they feel that way. Yep. It's just that it doesn't represent all truth. No. Nope. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the success we do with fascinating womanhood. So true. No, that, that's, we we're, not talking, we're not talking about statistics. Uh, I surely don't mean fascinating womanhood. When I'm talking about statistics, like 50% is a, a popular uh, analogy. Would you would you jump uh, with a with a parachute from from a plane if you knew that you, there is only 50% chance of it uh, uh, unfolding? Would you do it? Talking about apples and oranges, that doesn't make in a marriage relationship. How does that make sense? It's death well, versus... If, if, if you have 50% chance of, of divorce, and by the way, 80% 80, 80 of the cases uh, women initiated, so uh, that, that's the jump. I hate, I, hate, I hate to say it, but it, it's actually in some ways worse than you're saying because 50% divorce yeah. doesn't count the ones that stay together that are miserable. So Exactly. So that, exactly. you know, but it doesn't mean that's inevitable. They lack the knowledge, and that's what we're trying to give them. That's actually, that's uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> I'm not the most popular and not most representing of MacTals because I believe that uh, if you know what to look for in you, if you, uh, MacTal actually stands for men going their own way. Yes. So it implies owning the way. So if, if a man knows what he's doing, what he wants and, when, and how to achieve it, then and only then there is a, a way also to do, to go through more or less say traditional marriage, but you can you have to be very careful and very skillful in it. That's that's my 
position? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, everyone gets to make a choice, and that's fine. And um, I just think that there there are choices that lead to great relationships. There may be some people that choose not to do it. You know, that's that's their their right, and I support that. I I honor that. Me too.